Hello, welcome to Enlightening. Thanks so much for being here today. Today, Victor is gonna teach me and you about Service Mesh and about Kuma in particular. We're doing a series on Service Mesh. We did uh, Linkerty last week and we'll do Istio next week and Cilium too in November. So welcome so much, Victor. So glad to have you. I'm uh, glad to be here. It's great uh, that uh, you providing me with this platform to teach people with uh, the beauty in some internals of uh, Kuma Service Mesh. I'm so excited. Tell us about I'm, you. I'm, I'm and... excited as well. Yeah. <laughs> I like that about us. I can tell, um, I, well, I want to hear about you, but I can infer already that you're a professional streamer just based <laughs> on your super professional streamer looking background. But uh, tell yeah. us about you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, I was do. I'm a principal developer advocate at uh, Kong. And uh, if you have a developer advocate in your title, you must have a streaming <laughs> setup because that's what we do <laughs> for the last, you know, two three years. The thing there needs to be the... some purple light in your background, or clearly you don't know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> yes. 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 The things have changed significantly for us for like uh, for our doing the duties in the past we were like travel and speaking at the conferences and spending yeah. a lot of time in hotels now we still we still at home and we are streaming uh from our places and uh, you know everything should look you know good and uh, professional and in style of modern youtube and and, and and things like that you know yeah when i meet someone new and they're like what do you do for a living i like to be like oh i'm a i'm a 44 year old professional streamer <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's how we do. It. So, like, I always struggle to explain. And when the people, yeah. people, especially like in, in in school, you know, kind of like uh, when you are over a certain uh, age, you you're not making uh, new friends anymore. You're making friends <laughs> with parents of your kid friends. Okay. And uh, and and it's normal people. You know, the people that go to office and doing some office stuff, and they ask like, uh -huh. "What do you do?" And I was like, um, Let's call it education. You know, uh, I work in IT <laughs> and I do education. Okay, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah especially like, like with the light board. Yeah, mm -hmm. I feel it. Like. It's not like I'm. A, um, it's not like I'm ashamed with the things that I do, but it's much easier to explain into words that you know that what's what's the difference between evangelism and advocacy, and uh, you know, without going into this kind of like a. Um, uh, in the deeps uh, of explaining this. Yeah, yeah. I do consultancy, I do education, and I'm in IT. So that's something Love that it. you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> How to say it in a snappy way. Um, exactly. I want to say, yes. yeah. Hi to Srinatha. Hello. Thank you so much for being here, friend. So glad to have you. Um, what? So, so before I actually met you already, we've streamed together during a, a cloud native live show. But before I'd heard, before that, I'd heard of you, but I thought you were a Kafka guy. Like I knew, um, I knew you wrote, wrote a book called Kafka in Action. I'm gonna link uh, to it. Yeah, oh, Phil Snobble's here. Hello, Phil Snobble. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did I... you? So I was. So now you're a Kong guy or a Service Mesh guy or a Kuma guy. Tell me how you got from one to the other, please. Um, yeah, that's actually um, very, very interesting, uh, very interesting conversation. Um, essentially, I came from um, um, from consultancy background, and I spent, uh -huh. uh, I guess, over maybe up to eight years in in the data world, distributed systems mm -hmm. world, distributed databases world. Um, I started in the okay. world of uh, distributed. Uh, in memory databases, data grids, uh, moved to world of streaming data and start, start doing a lot of work around the Kafka and the technologies around the uh, data streaming. And uh, like two and a half years back, I, I switched to more on kind of like an API and uh, data application layer and like software defined networks and Kubernetes world. It's definitely changed for me, um, you know, Emergence of the Kubernetes as a, as a platform for deploying mm -hmm. uh, changed the way how I approach um, the the things what I do. Uh, one of the things mm -hmm. that I start doing is uh, explaining people how to run stateful workloads uh, like Kafka, like databases inside the Kubernetes world. What kind of things to pay attention? Some of the things are ready to be implemented, so you can just simply um, you, you want some some of the things. Some of the things needs to be tweaked. Uh, specifically uh -huh. 
uh, world. Uh, Kafka is notoriously uh, difficult if you deploy this in a certain. Kafka was not designed to be cloud native to, to the very beginning. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, it was designed to be running on the bigger, you know, the VMs and the the bare metal machines. Um, and over the years, uh, many contributors they 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 make this Kafka more cloud native friendly. And now we have a uh, different operators that allow you to do this. There's open source in CNCF called StreamZ. There's a uh, proprietary that comes from the different vendors. And um, so that time I started like looking at the Kubernetes world and what things are available. And uh, it fascinated me a lot with the, the the networking capabilities, what the things can, can be done and uh, um, what I can uh, tell people and how I can uh, show what's the best practices. So right now I do a lot of things with uh, with Kubernetes at uh, Quant. Quant is a it's a cloud API connectivity company, so, and uh, we're doing the things with uh, with you know API, you know, REST <laughs> API, gRPC, um, and service mesh. It's it's kind of like people like to talk about this as kind of another yeah. side of the coin uh, when we're talking about APIs. Um, I. I I have some things. Well, I want to say hi to some friends, and then I have some things to say and questions to ask. But um, uh, Fuel Snobble is here. Hello, Fuel Snobble. Um, always fun to have Fuel Snobble. Gorbaj is here, which is great. He says hello from India. Gorbaj is my great question asker. Code with Sean is here. Hello, Code with Sean. And uh, Fuel Snobble. <laughs> I've never had any problems with Kafka clusters in cloud. Yeah, seriously, though. Like, <laughs> Perfect. You know? <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, easy peasy. So it sounds like you're, what's interesting to me is, um, it sounds like you were naturally touching technologies like Kafka for, uh, event driven stuff and like, um, just data stuff that are both big challenges, events and data. Once you move into a cloud native distributed architecture. And so, um, and so you've been right in the middle of trying to figure that out. It sounds like. Yeah, a lot of um, um, Kubernetes was very eye opener for application deployment, uh, and many people just like wanted to. All of a sudden, they wanted to run all workloads in in Kubernetes, and uh, uh -huh. people saying, "Okay, so like I'm running my you know my apps there. Like, what could go wrong? Like, what's what could go wrong <laughs> if I would just decide to deploy a um, heavily distributed system on top of another distributed system uh, that depends in that on uh, another distributed system? If we're running Kubernetes, it's a distributed system across like a multiple uh, multiple machines underlying infrastructure. You're running Kafka that is distributed system that will be relying on zookeeper uh, for the you know the some some time in the past zookeeper was the integral part of this deployment plus you need to think about how you can think about the storage and how the storage will be distributed so there was a lot of uh, things to talk about this um you know what, what what's the what could go wrong with the with the storage what kind of type of storages you need to use what's the network capabilities would needs to be needs to be taken care of the um, and uh, during the time when I was talking about those things, I also learned a lot of um, through the customer deployments. I spent uh, some time in uh, professional services. So I was doing um, actual deployments and integration um, for for customers just like happen to go uh, the customer side and spend the. Uh, I don't know, like uh, the week uh, trying to, you know, install the things in their infrastructure. Um, and uh, with this, I learned a lot of, um, the, you know, there's a famous joke about like CNCF when you're looking and they're trying to explain to people CNCF landscape and you can always yeah. have a meme from uh, It Always Sunny in Philadelphia where the Charlie Day would, you know, <laughs> the, the character will explain you know, who's the Pepe Silva and uh, like how to deliver mail to, to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Fuel Snobble, I hope you're still here. Fuel Snobble said, if someone says the word zookeeper, I run to the woods. And then you said it. So not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> now, not anymore. Now we, um, now we got rid of this, and uh, the and Kafka runs its own uh, metadata service these days. And you know, you can be happy. Uh, there not, you go. not, 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 not everyone is happy as as, as, as always, but <laughs> majority of the people happy without having zookeeper right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so last time I learned about <laughs> distributed clusters, I realized there's another circle to hell. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's absolutely. You'll see all just a ray of sunshine in our stream every week. <laughs> Love you, Peel Snobble. Okay, so um, let's give this conversation some context. Uh, let's, I, I think there are two things I think I want to know context wise before we dig into Kuma specifically. One is I'd like to understand kind of like what problem, I guess uh, first maybe a general definition of service mesh because we, we we were saying we're doing service mesh. So I'd like to make sure we're level, level set on that. And then like, what was the scene like when Kuma was created? Like, why did Kuma need to get made? Why was the current technology already in the landscape not enough? Those are my two questions. Uh, so when we're talking about service mesh, I think um, service mesh is like, um, remember the story when, when um, a few like scholars or old people they've kind of like a the thinkers scholars philosophers they met the elephant and mm -hmm. because they were old uh their vision was slightly impaired so they would not be able mm -hmm. to you know see everything clearly however they were able to touch the elephant and the different people were touching this in different parts and uh they will have a different idea what exactly they touching because of the, uh -huh. you know, the rough skin what is it is it uh is it snake like because of the 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 nose like is it snake uh -huh. say. so the, the skin is rough something is big what, what is that so same thing is that okay they, they give a different definition of this this animal and the same thing with the depends of who you're talking about uh, service uh -huh. you're talking uh, the people on infrastructure they deploy and say, oh that's the thing that you deploy to get observability or uh -huh. you're talking about the thing that you know some people who who already deep into service and say they, they might say oh you don't need this because you're running only two microservices and it's it's just like over complicated things mm -hmm. um I think in in ge general, like very kind of like a the Oxford dictionary type of definition of a source yes. mesh, that would be a concept <laughs> that allows you to have a some sort of centralized control plane over uh, over your application, so you will be able to declaratively define a the traffics and the de declaratively define how your application are communicating. Um, Essentially, service mesh contains like two parts, and it's going to be one to many relationship. There would be a control plane that would be responsible for holding configuration, and mm -hmm. there will be data planes that will be deployed uh, with your application and um, mm -hmm. provide the actual communication between your application. So, so yeah. No, go ahead. Ser a service mesh is a technology that gives you a centralized control plane. You said over your application, and I wanted to double check. Over that. your application communication, I would say. Oh, uh, okay. Over application communication. Yeah. So, like, imagine, yeah. imagine. Let's imagine, uh, like, before we go into microservices, people, people also like to talk about microservices when they talk about service mesh, but it's not necessarily uh, requirement. So let's talk about this. Any distributed network application. So uh -huh. we have a monolithic application, some Java e application server. If you know, if you um, uh, the, the old enough, you remember the times. And when you deploy application on your application server, you have certain things out of the box. For example, uh -huh. you want to connect to database and application server uh, already have a connection pool configured in um, someone, some system administrator configured this to you. Mm -hmm. So when you deploy application into application server, um, you're getting first thing is a service discovery because you're just saying, okay, so I know the name, mm -hmm. GNDI name, it's, it's it's Java thing, but it's it's not a real one. You know the name and application server will inject you actual address of this database server. Mm -hmm. The next thing is that you might want to have um, some sort of um, ability to have reliable connectivity because you don't want to open connection database every time you need to run the query and you don't want to spend the time to manage this. So you will have a connection pool to this to this system and uh, the application server provides you with this. So your application, you program against this type of API. So service discovery... Mm -hmm 
connection pool, reliability, retries. Um, also, your application might not need to store the passwords to the system because your infrastructure will have a you know, connection pool. Um, as a developer, I don't really care about security. <laughs> I don't want to care mm -hmm. because as operations people need to need to think about this. Is my connection to my database secure? Um, so, how I can do this? And usually, operations people will go there. They generate certificates um, um, that they put the certificate. If it's a, some sort of like a mutual TLS, they will have a certificate that they will sign all the certificate, and they will have a, like a mutual communication between. Um, your application in your database. So next thing is that you also need to have um, your application talks to database, but your application has some sort of UI you need to, or like um, API as a REST endpoint or, or whatever, you need to expose this outside world. So mm. for this, you need to put the load balance in front and you don't want to expose this with the outside world without any type of security. You need to put some sort of like a HTTPS certificates on top of this. So you also need to implement all these things. Uh, so and yeah, I thought that exposing it to the outside world was a job for ingress type technologies, not a job for service mesh. Exactly, uh, but yeah. we, we will talk about this to table this question because this is a, a very okay. very interesting question to talk about. Okay, um, should I write I'm, it I'm down? Kind of like Expose a... your application. To... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, of course. Okay. It is. Um, it is a uh, actually is going to be a big thing. Uh, hopefully this year at the KubeCon because there would be a bunch of uh, announcements and there's a bunch of uh, um, um, kind of like a specification and a lot of work that is happening in some of the um, uh, special interest groups. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about this Gamma project, which is a gateway API Hi. for for merge technology. So, um, okay, we're gonna talk about this. So think okay. about all the things I that wanna... you just write down. Uh -huh. Think about yeah. this: service discoverability, connection uh -huh. pooling, reliability, uh -huh. centralized configuration, um, exposing the application to outside world. So all these things. What was the third thing you said? Did you say reliability? Uh, yeah. So like you have a connection pooling. That's something uh, that, that you can put. The the connection between application is reliable. Re retries, circuit oh, okay. breakers, all these kind of things. What's connection pooling? Um, so in the world of uh, the good old days. Uh, uh -huh. when we were not we were not uh, web scale um uh, people were doing this you have a request that comes into your application uh -huh. and uh if you need to fetch something from database for one request you go into database you open connection database you do a sql query and get the result back um and when you're running this in a, with the hundreds of connections uh, you uh -huh. immediately uh, depleting um this like a network stack that talks to your database so you need to some sort of system that will be managing those connections maybe okay. you don't have to close connection all the time you can keep some of the connection open whenever you need to call it and after that you will take the connection out of the pool and uh you know you run your query and you send back so this connection pooling management of the connections um uh, so the, the 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 database will not be hammered with every possible connection so all okay. things with the network connectivity that people usually either put into their applications you know those mm. those um the techniques of optimizing uh, connection pooling all these things were part of your application mm -hmm. now as you can see here, we already talked about this multiple things in uh, on the screen. We didn't talk about uh, security. Security is also very important, so that's why we put it in the one, two, three, four, five as a number six on our list. Okay. Um, and if you cannot monitor something or, or if you cannot measure something, you cannot control it. So observability bit is also important, right? So mm -hmm. the how you would observe this, you need to put some, some additional libraries inside your application. You put the, the metrics library, you put the tracing library in your application uh, mm -hmm. that allows you to integrate with third parties. So multiple things developers need to do in mm -hmm. their app. Does it look want... like a microservice to you now, Whitney? <laughs> it looks like like they're, like what's left for the application logic. If it's like exactly. a little bit of logic, and like the rest is all like how to connect to everything else in the system. Exactly, exactly. So um, I want to give some attention to the chat. We have some great chat happening right yeah. now. Let's do uh, it. Phil Snobel says I, that they never get to build the stuff; they get just inherit inherit stuff. 
from other people. So like, so it feels almost like right now, somewhere in the world, there's a distributed cluster that I'll inherit someday. Um, oh, yes. Kor cool. Koromaju has, uh, has a question, but I, maybe we'll get there. So Kuma, does Kuma support application communication on layer seven and layer four? So uh, we talked answers, about yes. <laughs> the different OSI layers last week. Uh, the answer, short answer is yes. And um, layer seven is the application layer and layer four is more like TLS, the UDP uh, TCP layer, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, those uh, layers uh, uh, will require some of the like additional, like a treating um, to specifically um, you will be able to distinguish some of the uh, some of the workloads when you're running on L seven. So you will be able to do like an introspection of uh, whatever comes over the wire. You can inject like HTTP headers or modify headers and do some sort of like a transformation to the HTTP level. On TCP level, usually it's a stream of bytes. Um, you don't have any notion in terms of like what, what those bytes are mean because that's why you need to go in the higher on the uh, protocol level level. Um, so and code with Sean, making sure that I'm clear. I did say TLS when I meant TCP. So, uh, TCP UDP is layer four. Thank you so much for uh, helping us be clear. I, I don't, I don't, I don't no. 100% uh, agree. I think the TLS, you can, you can like wrap TLS, like SSH, like TCP on, on, the, on, the, on the level four, but it's semantic, you know, I'm not. Gonna... Yeah. Yeah. And and that's actually its own great point because uh, when Flynn was talking about the OSI model last week, he was just like, "Yeah, it's kind of messy in there. People disagree with what it is exactly, which is uh, really not what you want in tech." But <laughs> apparently, <laughs> that's yeah. how it is. Yeah. Um, so it is. It yeah. is a yeah. So you basically when you go in from the one level. Uh, from the like level seven going down, it's just like all encapsulation, or like when you're going from down up, it's mm -hmm. encapsulation. You're putting some additional metadata, and we're going down. You kind of like peeling off some of the uh, some some of all this kind of like information. Okay, I like that. So model. you 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 make the great point uh, when you said it turns out that uh, for actual application logic, we don't have much, right? So we yeah. don't need to worry about all these things, all these libraries, all these um, integrations with the things. Like, where's the where's the logic, right? Um, where's the logic? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Or or having to make your developers like feel snobble, think think through all these things when um, everyone's having to think through the same problems. It would, feels like it should be solved on a different level. Um, but I have a I have a question too about. Kuma in particular, like when, where in the timeline did uh, Linkerd apparently, Flynn said it was the first one. Yep. Like um, where is, did Kuma come in the timeline and why did Kuma get created in the context of other service meshes? Like what problem uh, in particular is Kuma solving? Yeah, great question. So um, Linkerd 100% is pioneering some of those ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you uh, remember, the first version was actually in, in Java or actually technically Scala. And after that, they, they realized that, okay, so there's there's a lot of things going on here. Um, mm -hmm. And those things are not necessarily needs to belong to application. So they, they took these things and make them as a like separate binary. Yeah. And this separate binary that will be running next to your application, it will be running on the local host. The latency between the applications will be low. And the communication between the, 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 the where the mesh comes from. The communication actually happens through the through those kind of like a smaller components, the binaries that will be running next to your application. Okay. And uh, Linkerd, they went the route of creating their own kind of like a small proxy uh, uh -huh. that will be able to, you know, provide all the things with the service discoverability connection between apps like uh, centralized configuration all these kind of things um but there's another group of people uh, in another web scale startup uh, that time now it's not the, not the startup anymore um in lyft they they created this um super fast proxy called envoy okay and uh, one of the cool things about envoy is that it is first of all uh configurable through api 
you will be able to change configuration on the fly. Mm -hmm. You will be able to enable all these things. You will be able to observe what happens on the proxy side of things. Um, so you will be able to collect metrics. You will be able to collect all the things. You will be able to um, have, say, encryption of the communication out of the box because it, it was uh, solved on the proxy side of things. Okay. So we come in into a world where we have uh, service meshes that either will use uh, sidecar. They, everyone is using sidecar these days, kind of like a mm -hmm. second generation of the service meshes. First generation, your sidecar is part of your application, those libraries that we were talking about. Second mm -hmm. one, we have an external sidecar. And uh, at the time when the Kuma came uh, came about, there was already a few implementations um, uh, yeah, that were existing. And uh, the, probably the, the most known is Istio. Mm -hmm. uh, came, uh, everything that comes from Google usually have a buzz in, in the world, so they get some uh, free publicity. And uh, Istio uses uh, uh, Envoy as a sidecar as well. Mm -hmm. However, there's an interesting... Um, um, I'm not saying it's contradiction, but this is an interesting story that happens in our uh, the world. We love Kubernetes. Everyone mm -hmm. wants to be uh, on Kubernetes. Everyone claiming to be on Kubernetes. However, there's still um, hard dependency on Kubernetes. You need to change uh -huh. a lot in your infrastructure. And say technology like Istio would say, oh, is it me doing this? Like how? how? I don't know what just oh. happened. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's oh. see. No, no. Oh, yeah. So it looks like um, some uh, some gestures uh, available in the, <laughs> in the new update of operating system. So, uh, yeah. So I was talking about Istio. And the people st start looking to Istio, but Istio was created a very hard dependency on Kubernetes. Istio okay. configuration was relying on, uh, heavily relying on CRDs, um, you need to understand some of the things about Istio um, in order to, like, understand things around Kubernetes uh, in order to do the, the, the Istio stuff. So the mm -hmm. first thing, just table for a second. Second thing is that multi-region multi deployment. Kubernetes, distributed system. Uh, you can deploy this uh, across uh, multiple different locations. I, I need to find a way how I can stop this because this is annoying. Okay, I found <laughs> so if you have you a... I, I would like to say hi to some people in chat. Bucky Buck yes. here. Hi, Bucky Buck. Thank you for coming. And then we also have a question about, this is probably jumping ahead by a lot. So we talked about Envoy sidecars and the quick question of whether the uh, Kuma supports complex OAuth 2 authentication. Uh, LinkedIn user, unfortunately, we don't know who you are. We need to table this question because I don't think it is right thing to do on the service mesh side of things, but we can talk about when I will, will explain everything. We can talk about some of the design patterns uh, of implementing the distributed systems in the, in the world of uh, gateways, uh, so, so service meshes. Kubernetes and other kind of things. So let's 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 table this question for now. Exciting, cool. So we're saying um, Linkerd doesn't use Envoy. We want something that uses Envoy. Istio has a hard dependency on Kubernetes, and um, and then you were starting into something else before we got distracted. Yes, um, we talk about distributed uh, nature of um, geographically distributed nature of Kubernetes clusters. Mm -hmm. Okay. So think about this. Um, we 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 want to. Everyone wants to deploy the the multi uh, multi region deployments in one of the region will go down. Uh, we have ability to recover or somehow move the traffic more to the healthy location. Uh, but all this architecture create a complexity that your application needs to be taken into account. So you need to have some mm -hmm. sort of like load balancers that will be send the traffic in case one of the region will go down. So that, that needs to be automatically switched and send the traffic to another location. Um, mm -hmm. And all these things you need to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the things with the uh, that, that comes as a kind of like a side effect of the you know having dependency on on Kubernetes is that uh, there's a lot of uh, background that needs to be covered. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So when when the Kuma was initially created, there was a three ideas that needs to be uh, part of this kind of deployment and why Kuma was uh, was conceived basically. Um, first of all, is developer experience. We wanted to have a service mesh that would be very user friendly, uh -huh. meaning that you can start like very in in, in a minute. Uh, definitely, Kubernetes helps to do a lot with the you know user startup because Kubernetes allows to do a lot of automation. However, not everyone i know that's shocking and we're talking this in the uh, on the cncf world and we're talking uh, here here as well shocking but not everyone running the um their workloads on kubernetes uh, <laughs> of course we know uh, it's, a, it's the best platform to 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 run your apps notoriously difficult to start over you need to have either some sort of um the 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 vendor specific implementation um, you either rely on whatever uh, managed service provides you, or you have a very rock solid implementation of the Kubernetes things like uh, Tenzu or like OpenShift that you will be installing in your organization. Some people not ready to do this leap. They want to run yeah. these VMs, and they have tons of VMs. They want to run this. We wanted to run the service mesh there, and the people will, you know, kind of uh, will be happy with running this. Um, so we call it universal mesh, meaning that this mesh can be run in Kubernetes, it can be run in VMs, it can be run on bare metal, what have you. So that's what we call uh, universal mesh. And a third thing is, uh, I already touched this with the, with the problem statement, is that we want to run multi-zone deployment uh, and we're providing the the ways how the people can build geographically distributed systems so the third point with uh, with kuma is you know multi-zone uh, multi-mesh deployment out of the box works with geographically Yeah. Distributed so user. We, yeah, want, yeah. we wanted to create an environment um, that will be not environment. So we can create infrastructure that would be unified across all this. If you think about this, if it's universal mesh, can you connect Kubernetes, uh, your apps running in Kubernetes and your apps running on VMs? And the answer with Kuma answer is yes. You will be able to create a unified environment inside um um inside this mesh where you will have universal discovery service mesh comes with the uh, the, the service discovery through built-in dns it comes mm -hmm. with uh, a unified policies for managing traffic say you don't want to create connection for each application if you need to cross uh, cross zone or cross region and you can have a ability to to manage how the traffic will go through the we call it zone ingress and zone egress components. So all these things would be unified once it's deployed uh, within within the platform. What was the what was the 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 words you said? Universal discovery and the second thing that you just described. Uh, declarative traffic policies. Declarative traffic uh, or, policies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And then we have a question: multi cloud via VPNs. Uh, so no um okay. the service mesh provides capabilities that will taking care of this communication you don't need to deploy this uh, through uh, through vpn as long as there is a you know connection between the system you can put this uh, the component we call it like zone ingress and egress so we will be able to control outgoing and in incoming traffic through the you know the things that is important Um, and uh, security, the benefits of security, kind of like uh, automating the ways how um, the connection will be secured. Um, we like to talk about uh, the concept of zero trust, uh, meaning that how you would identify the service is um, 
is is good or bad for the system and one of the approach to uh, to do this is kind of like every we will consider everything is bad we don't trust uh -huh. anyone yeah and only uh, those systems that will put uh, that we will put into kind of our declarative policies will have a ability to invoke other apis have a communication with other systems um and uh these days service mesh not only kuma many service meshes they they used um to implement this this concept of zero trust which is again you cannot buy zero trust zero trust is the set of uh the procedures that your organization needs to enforce plus you can automate sort of procedures uh using the technology that we're talking about so i love this what i crave is a what did you call it a webster's dictionary definition of like kuma is blank do you yeah. think we can do that kuma, yeah i think kuma oh. is a universal control plane uh for your service mesh oh um, since technologies like Istio and uh, Kuma and some others, they use Envoy as their um, as their data plane proxy or as their sidecar proxy. Mm -hmm. The secret sauce. When I say secret sauce, I'm just doing air quotes because there's no secret there. It's open source. You can go and see all the secrets. <laughs> but all these uh, things, uh, how um, control plane communicates the data plane, will be solved on the on the on the control plane side of things. And that's why I'm saying secret sauce is actually in control plane. How the policies are structured, you know, how many steps you need to do to enable certain capabilities. So that's why uh, control plane is the heart of the service mesh. Since the service mesh will be relying on some external components like Envoy to do configuration, it needs to have some sort of like built-in ability to do, you know, the thing. So that's why the control plane is essence of, um, um, of, of of the of the um of the source mesh love it so um so I, i'm loving this i'm totally getting what's value and why it, why it exists i love it is there anything else you want to add to this definition before i draw a box around it and things are very official and can never be changed i'm <laughs> being sarcastic love it. yeah <laughs> no um Yes, so I think it should be should be all right. Um, I can okay. definitely I can I can definitely check uh, official name. Oh, um, you would have. <laughs> make sure we're in line I, with I just, the I just, department. No, no, no. I I just checked this, <laughs> and my definition is is perfect. If you Great. remember the the quote from the um, from the boys uh, TV show, it's what's perfect. Perfect. fascinating about like the like I do this kind of. Uh, explainer regularly and what's fascinating about the definition is like the definition always like if i if we heard this first without all the context like technically we understand it but we don't really get it like it took you explaining like oh it's really valuable that can be used with kubernetes and vms and bare metal and it's really valuable that like geographically uh sub distributed systems can use it like but it, like so i wouldn't have appreciated it if we if we started the episode with that but now with I, all the context um, i'm like this is really cool yeah i i i probably um it, it was it, it came it came in naturally uh through the um through the years of of trying to explain complex things uh, to people <laughs> and one of the things that i appreciate how the things were explained it's actually outside of the world it at all uh i this year i attended a i'm i like a lot of fitness and i attended the the class for crossfit level one coaches is the basic level that you need to attend and the pass the test in case you want to be a you know the coach in in the crossfit uh -huh. and the crossfit nice. uh has a definition uh crossfit uh -huh. is the constantly variable exercises performed functional exercises performed in the um, high intensity and you think about this that's the definition of the of the sport it's uh, uh -huh. variated functional movements are performed in the consistent uh, or like uh, on different levels of uh, intensity uh -huh. but you can take every word and break this down every word and put the as a, as a diagram <laughs> thank you kuma is yeah. universal what does that mean universal yeah. kuma uh -huh. universal control plane what's the control plane what's the, like for your service mesh or for your application connectivity that's the yeah. 
that's the beauty kind of like trying to pack very complex thing into one sentence that yeah. you can use this remember our starting conversation about how you would you know but what uh, you can say you're doing here um yeah and it's a problem that's specific yeah. to every technology and it's a problem as a learner when you're just like i just quickly want to know what something is and you read a sentence and you can't you don't know the deeper meaning behind every word yeah um you'll almost need every technology should have their definition but then also a diagram <laughs> like this is what this phrase means one of the it is all very well thought out yeah one of the things that i like to do in my work uh, as a as an educator as developer advocate is give people enough context to lift them mm -hmm. up in their understanding so we can start having conversation on the stem level of abstraction so providing the some sort of like a basis of the things so we can have a conversation about the things that I wanted them to talk about, uh, I want to explain them about, but they also need to have a bare minimum to understanding. Yeah. Um, we have some questions for you in chat. Yes, let's do it. Um, how is the private key insert rotation experience in Kuma? Yes, so um, one of the components of the secret sauce of the control plane mm -hmm. is that control plane is responsible, it's a brain, it's a brain of your operation. It's a brain mm -hmm. of the system, and uh, there's lots of responsibilities that this control plane will will uh, will take. So first of all, like consistency of configuration, making sure that every component, every data plane that runs inside our Kubernetes, our service mesh, is healthy, get the latest and greatest version of the configuration, uh, so we have a consistency. Another thing that through this is a kind of like a, another side effect is that automation control plane uh, inherently will be doing a lot of automation on the sides of the data plane it needs to be shipping configuration. So your data plane will be reconfiguring different routes will be changing. You can have a um, very cool uh, topologies of the how the traffic will flow through. And one of the things that uh, uh, control planes provides it's to be in a certificate authority. Since it's already brain, it's already mm. owns some of the uh, some of the notion of uh, uh, of the kind of like a source of truth. It also can be authority that will be providing the uh, uh, you know remember the uh, the five, fifth element, a little, a little Dallas multipass. So uh, provide for every service this multipass that the service has this passport to access uh, other services inside the control plane. So uh, control uh, inside inside the service mesh. So control plane will be issuing certificates that will be distributed across these data planes. And this rotation is a matter of like, you know, seconds. So if you have hundreds of the services, um, that you will be able to, you know, send updated certificate in a matter of seconds. One of the examples that I like to bring uh, when we're, we're talking about this particular topic. So at Quant, we uh, we we build Kuma and we also donated Kuma to uh, CNCF, and also we use this internally for uh, building our own uh, the cloud product. So internally, it's the we we use this. And one of the reasons why uh, they want to use it, our engineering team, they wanted to have a MTLS across um, across across the system because it is a requirement to have some sort of data in motion encryption whenever you're providing some sort of public uh, service uh, or managed service. It is mm -hmm. part of the requirement that you know mm -hmm. some organization asking for 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 public um, the. Uh, services and we were able to implement this uh within a uh, days and we change the time of rotation of those certificates between the services into kind of days into minutes it's incredible uh productivity uh -huh. boost for the teams whenever they're looking just to simply enable data in motion uh, encryption so cool. answer, it's, it's not the so short answer, but it is a answer. Yes, it is easy certificate uh, in the uh, key rotation that handled by control plane. Handled by the control plane, which is a great segue into um, to core Maju's question. So it's uh, so what's so what's data plane versus what's control plane and what's the role of data plane and control plane proxies? Um, 
Can I, uh, I give think, my beginner's yeah. understanding and you can tell yes. me how wrong I am? Absolutely. Uh, no, 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 no. You probably heard this multiple <laughs> um, times. And I you heard have it a... only once during the contour episode, which was many months ago now. But um, it was, uh, Sanjay was our guest. And Sanjay said that the control plane is like the, the part that the human interacts with. And that's where you can figure all of the settings that you want for the, the cluster. And then for for contour, at least, like the data plane is what does the work of actually rooting the requests. So um, the control plane is where you do con your configuration. Data plane is what's actually moving the requests around. Is that correct? It is. Bio. It's very much correct. Um, I am very visual person. That's why I'm enjoying, you know, the things what you're doing <laughs> with the light boarding. But also, I like to bring some metaphors in the... Uh, um, one of the metaphors when I would like to talk, when I said, I already said control plane is a brain. Mm -hmm. So essentially, uh, control plane, uh, it is a it is a brain of your operation. Say mm -hmm. you have a two two people, they need to interact. You, uh, you need to tell someone to do something. You need to tell someone to, okay, so pick up the pen and start writing. So mm -hmm. your brain will send the signal to your um, through your uh, neural system to different uh, parts mm -hmm. of your body. Pick up this. So as a, as a human, we can understand certain you know commands. So that's why mm -hmm. when someone tell us to do something, we can understand this. But our brain can actually translate it into the world into the language that our uh, neurons will understand and send the signal to, towards the hand. Same thing with the control data plane uh, type of uh, mentality. Uh, as a as an operator, we send some sort of the predefined command to control plane. Mm -hmm. So control plane will interpret this and will send uh, more you know more information that will be required to data plane to perform particular action. In the world of um, uh, say like uh, uh, API gateways, or like let's talk about Kubernetes. Kubernetes also has the concept of control plane and data plane. Control plane, this is where mm -hmm. all uh, Kubernetes configuration will be stored, and your data planes. That's actually where you you will be running um, actual workloads. The, the, where your Kubelet is running. This is uh, the, on, on actual places. So that's why control plane will be responsible for. Uh, handling configuration and managing uh, configuration and data play will be responsible for actually doing the thing in the world of mm -hmm. contour which is uh, api gateway um, uh, you can have a separation between control plane and data plane you, sometimes this uh, there's no separation sometimes some of the products projects they come with the control plane data plane big in. so that's why so if you take the envoy for example Envoy provides the API for configuring, so meaning that the configuration API is is built in, but also it provides the the ways how to 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 proxy your traffic. You can also have a control plane that will be separated from your data plane that will be running your traffic, and control plane will be only sending commands here. Mm -hmm. I hope it makes sense uh, to um, Kamraju. So is it? So I wrote on the board control plane to the brain. The config is set here at the control plane by the human and the control plane in turn configures the data plane. And then Appreciate I wrote it. data plane. Okay, great. Data plane is responsible for actually doing the thing. Um, when I say doing the thing, do I mean routing requests or are there other things it could be doing? If we're talking about um, in a generic term, control plane, uh -huh. data plane, it can be anything. So whatever okay. you're controlling, uh, okay. so that's why you're doing the thing. In the world of the service mesh and the API gateways, yes, it's the responsibility for actually pushing bytes uh, and the routing traffic, um, encrypting uh, payload, um, do header transformation, request transformation, add and removing headers, checking if the G G GWT token is, is correct. Uh, mm -hmm. token, I guess. Um, so whatever is your controlling, whatever is required for, for your system, um, mm -hmm. uh, say like 
in if we I bet, uh, if we recall some of the Kafka past, we build the Kafka as a service, um, uh, and control plane was responsible for spinning out and the killing Kafka clusters. There was a control okay. plane that was managing where these clusters are deployed, like how to manage them, and it was responsible for health of this and the sending commands. Hey, are you alive? And the cluster data plane, actual cluster, will be responding back. Same with the control with the with the service meshes. Am I going too deep? Just a... <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested, in... <laughs> but I think it's great. Um... I appreciate from Koromaju the reminder to level set. It's sometimes hard in this show to like, technically we talked about this on the show before. Should we do a refresher? Um, yeah. So it's good. I'm, I really appreciate the question. And so yes. if anyone uh, along the way, if there's anything you're, you're not catching on that we're not explaining, please, please ask. We're so happy to talk about it. Um, to, for the benefits. So we have universal discovery, declarative traffic policies, uh, the security, so we have automating the act of securing connections. Um, I'm noticing that maybe uh, observability, nothing about observability is mentioned in the benefits so far. One of the Do things, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we need, we need to put this um, uh, three pillars of observability. We need to collect uh -huh. the metrics to understand what is happening with the system right now. We need to have a, uh, collecting logs to understand the past, what has happened. And we also need to collect traces to see how different components of the system interact to each other. So having th this information uh, centralized, uh, collected on the on the data planes collecting on your apps um it's it's very crucial uh one of the mm -hmm. things that i like to say if you cannot uh, measure something you cannot control something if you mm -hmm. don't know what's going on with your system especially if you're running distributed system it would be very difficult to identify the problems how you would know when the users will call you and saying hey uh uh, we cannot uh, seems to log into our or like we were able to log in, but we we have a uh, instead of a list of our transactions, we we see kind of like a five hundred three error, whatever. Uh -huh. So, how we as engineers who will be supporting the system, how we can identify this? So, having the observability components is absolutely crucial. And um, but I will I will I will say but a little bit after because sometimes people trying to oversell um benefits of the service mesh they get too excited about this hey you're getting the observability out of the box and uh, you have uh, some some fun things you don't, you need to modify your application blah 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 certain things will require you to you know adapt your application for those environments but in general uh -huh. um you know for the basic user experience and simple 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 demos you will be able to enable observability of the box, start collecting metrics. You can see, you know, how long it takes this request to be served and the, the, the system will respond and things like that. So this is um, absolutely a benefit of having. Um, okay. Absolutely. Should I, yeah. Right enables observability out of the box or is that too lofty of a, like you said, in a simple scenario, it does. So Should I just leave it alone and put a no box no no observability it? absolutely it's okay. a, it's a benefit absolutely benefit uh huh just observability observability uh and uh, you can put the metrics traces and logs in inside kind of like a in the brackets or yeah. as a part of the observability like whatever you're getting um and it is again it's it's a part of uh you know um kind of in generic terms automation so some of the things that uh service mesh will bring into um is a is a is a, a, a benefit mm -hmm. automation of of the things not necessarily observability but in general you can automate a lot of um thing that will eat the time of operations team should i write observability automation observability and automation as a separate item Uh, with your permission, I'll leave automation off because it's too general. Automating what? And then we're getting, automating. we're going down a whole 
rabbit hole. Yeah, okay. well, yeah. We, we, you know, we, if we need it, we can talk about this. One of the examples that I provide automatic uh, uh, the certificate rotation. Some of the things that okay. is part of kind of security, you know. But uh, uh, in the uh, in the world without uh, service mesh, usually it's performed either through this some automation scripts or some sort of like a system that needs to be taken care of this. So yeah. I like it. Excellent. What's next? So uh, remember, uh, at, the, at this point of this uh, of the stream, you should ask Victor. Okay, but what about application? You know, we start talking about the, <laughs> all these things. Where's the, where's the application? Where's the code? Where's the code? <laughs> where's the yeah. business uh, logic and all this? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So. Um, <laughs> And uh, we've, uh, we've we we sort out all the infrastructure bits. So we when we run our application in uh, in this infrastructure in this environment of service mesh, we will have uh, automatic benefits. So we don't need to include those as a part of application. You can focus on your, your 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 application logic. You can uh, ship this as a container if you are running this in a, a continuous environment in in Kubernetes world. Um, if you running this in uh, VMs, you don't have to do this. You can run this as a, just like a operating system process, like a native application or mm -hmm. like a, whatever application you have. Um, and um, just to deploy this and enable uh, data plane uh, next to your application. All the traffic that will go to this node will go first to your proxy, and after that proxy will be uh, responsible to 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 send to send into into application code. So you can run it as a sidecar in a Kubernetes pod. Yep. You can run it as an operating system process. Is that what you said? Yes. So it is uh, like a typical. Uh, typical deployment uh, structure. Uh, definitely Kubernetes uh, popularized the concept of a sidecar pattern uh, uh -huh. by providing this, you know, automation uh, capabilities. Uh, but in general, uh, mm -hmm. sidecar pattern doesn't have to be, you know, containerized some of the things. When, whenever you're running a process next to your process and this process will be responsible for you interacting with inside the world, that's the sidecar. Um, the usually people sometimes sometimes there's kind of misconception between sidecar and ambassador right the pattern when okay. you kind of like someone will represent you so in this case the uh sidecar also can be ambassador because it will also represent your service because you're going outside through the through the egress uh -huh. um but anyway um that's it so when we're running this in kubernetes world it is the most you will get the most benefits through the Kubernetes magic. Uh, and by magic, I mean just Kubernetes automation. You have your namespace. Um, you put the label in namespace saying, hey, sidecar injection true. So in every pod that you will be deploying in this um, in this namespace will include sidecar. Um, mm -hmm. The control plane will be responsible for in order to establish secure communication between control data plane, you need to generate token. This token needs to be stored inside the control plane and be used to sign every request that go in between control plane and data plane. Um, and after that, uh, whenever connection is established, you will be able to send the communication. You will be able to uh, establish secured communication between the different application nodes. So Kubernetes does a lot of automation by simply putting this sidecar injection true as a... Mm -hmm. um, as a configuration for your namespace. And uh, for your apps, you just start using this. You immediately, whenever you uh, whenever you deploy this, uh, in Kuma, mm -hmm. one of the one of the things that you, you we, we, we mentioned in the very beginning, why Kuma simplified developer experience, we also mm -hmm. provide some sort of like a sane uh, defaults for certain things. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't know how the people will be running applications and where they will be running applications. We also like to include uh, some of the out-of-the-box policies. One mm -hmm. of the policies would be automatic retries. 
Mm -hmm. before you start thinking about this service mesh like kuma already will get you covered and some there will be some of the you know automatic retry say every request can be retried for five seconds with the um how we call it exponential back off and all these kind uh -huh. of things that will be predefined and ready to use Another so I, yes i want to back up and make sure i'm, I'm yes. following before you move yeah. forward any further so we talked about different ways Kuma can be run as a sidecar in a Kubernetes pod or as an operating system process. And so I, I imagine with VMs and bare metal, we're talking about the operating system process there. And then, um, we, then we started talking about how the application developer doesn't need to put write anything into their application. So my question right now before we move forward is, does, um, is, is it safe to say like Kuber, like period uh, application developer doesn't have to put anything in their application no matter how Kuma's run, no matter whether it's Kubernetes VMs or bare metal, like it doesn't, the developer just doesn't have to do it. Uh, there's one, one uh, exception probably that is, um, uh, that will come in the world of distributed tracing. Mm-hmm. So the way how distributed tracing works, generally it is every request will include special type of the header that with this header will be propagated uh, with the request. Uh, mm -hmm. If we need to call one service, needs to call another service and this another service needs to call another service, blah, blah, blah. Um, mm -hmm. So application technically doesn't need to be um, kind of like uh, implementing all these things but mm -hmm. you know propagations of the um of the headers is important thinking that your application needs to be aware that mm -hmm. it runs in an environment where application code needs to be propagating for say you have a one microservice that exposes some of the functionality through the rest endpoint but also it will require some of the functionality to uh to perform this say we have a you know, the customer portal and the customer portal will, will get the, uh, there would be another microservice that will get the customer, the, I don't know, figuring out ad address based on uh, geographic coordinates or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So we need to invoke this microservice. So whenever our microservice will invoke, we need to also make sure that we propagating a headers in order to we know that this is the part of the same request so we will be able to capture this information so this is very um kind of like a very kind of a niche use case but it is important uh -huh. case that you need to understand and mm -hmm. um uh, apart from that in order to um the application to operate in the service mesh uh, environment mm -hmm. It doesn't have to change anything. You don't need to put any knowledge inside your application. I I, I have this experiment that I did myself. Uh, Google Cloud Platform uh, um, has this uh, GitHub repository called Microservices Demo. It, this is kind of like a, a thing that they develop to 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 demonstrate some of the bits of uh, Google Cloud Platform and Istio. And uh, in order to prove the point that when I run this in the service mesh world, it will not require modification of your application. I just okay. took whatever containers they have, I mm -hmm. changed the configurations instead of Istio, run them in uh, in Kuma. Technically, mm -hmm. I, I, I just like changed the namespace sidecar injection instead of like uh, injecting uh, Istio sidecars, I was injecting Kuma sidecars and it worked. And mm -hmm. immediately I was able to collect the metrics traces i was able to call it logs i was able to enable mtls in my system so short answer is you don't have to change your application code in order to this 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 to work there will be small like uh, here and there side um side effects that you uh, might need to do this but in general the promise and kind of like a selling point of running things in in, in the in the service mesh is that you can, you know, just enable this environment um, and your apps doesn't have to know anything about this. So um, is there a reason you would want to run it as an operating system process in Kubernetes instead of a sidecar? Um, so 
it's it's all about your deployment uh, strategy i would say um when we deploy this inside the kubernetes as a sidecar we have one one cool benefit actually two um whenever we run the uh, container inside the sidecar mm -hmm. uh or sorry a container inside the pod these uh, containers inside one pod they can share network the shared local host mm -hmm. so there's no need to do any like a routing or 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 service discovery we don't need to go and you know asking for dns uh, or... and this allows us to um to configure actual routing for for our sidecar um when we're running this uh, we're running this as a pod. We can also share, you know, files between the systems. So the configuration um, or communication between sidecar and um, and our process basically negligible if you compare running your application next to operating system process. Uh, another like negative thing, if you want to run this as a um, operating system process you need to create these containers yourself mm -hmm. and you need to make sure that configuration that will be configured inside this container because you need to include mm -hmm. your application and you need to include uh, um, envoy binaries together with your application and this is where you need to rely uh, on uh, consistency that your operating uh, operation people will provide different like same version of on the void that this system is required when you're running this as a sidecar control plane will be responsible that it will run you know particular version that it was you know suited for for this particular thing so uh, short answer is definitely you could but like why would you <laughs> okay so it's easier to install as a sidecar, and then uh, Kuma shares the network with the app container, so, yep. which is yep. part of why it's easier to uh, install. Yeah, on, cool. on voice shares, not the Kuma. Ah, yes. Yeah, because we're running this in the... Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a yeah, data plane. Um, that actually, maybe it would be a good idea then to draw a diagram of how yep. of what's going on exactly. Um, yep. How do you think we want to do this? Do we want like more than one Kubernetes cluster? Just one Kubernetes cluster? What's happening inside it? Um, we can we can start just one one Kubernetes cluster. Um, okay. And uh, we'll see how we can go about this. So um, let's put the I don't know three nodes, whatever okay. uh, three nodes Kubernetes cluster. Um, do the nodes need to talk with each other, or are they just? Like, should I, mean, I stack it's, it's, them it's, like it's, this? It, yeah, no, I mean, it's just like a, like a actual Kubernetes uh, nodes that we're running. You don't okay. have, they, they will be, a, they will be interacting to each other. Yeah. Okay. That's the question. Just, um, just, so many, just to put, yeah. There are so many ways that different ways that people show a Kubernetes cluster that it's, uh, um, we, yeah. So we're going to do a three node cluster. Very, it is very fortunate that I did drew some, some diagram. Oh, Look but you're not allowed to week. screen share. There's a, there's a hard rule on this show. Yeah. It's, I will, um, I can, will text you, it to you. Okay. You can give it, give me the link in the private chat and I can put it yeah, in. But yeah, yes, I will. I will. I will the... So you, you will, you will get the idea what I would like to, um, to talk. Uh, I, 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 I kind of like the exercise of you having to communicate it to me. Yeah. Is this okay. seem good, good enough for uh Right. Cool. For our purposes. Um can I can, Yeah. Can I ask you to do this like one more time? So, let's yeah. start not from the Kubernetes. Since I was talking about okay. this is universal. Let's start with app. Say okay. you have a three apps. Call it three I don't apps. know, the customers, uh we we have a uh, the products and uh, uh -huh. another one would be i don't know like uh some ca product catalog uh i don't know the system that would be doing like a currency exchange so it's, it's our application okay. microsoft is one and uh, say yeah. in order to um to call to get the response from the customers information um you need to say for cart. the products yeah cart okay so 
as a, as a customer, you need to put the products in the cart. So there would be some sort of like a communication between them, right? Uh, okay, yes. Two, two applications. So those things are for the simplicity, for the sake of this, it's, it really doesn't matter how you deploy this. It, some sort of application container. It can be war file. It can be container in terms of Docker container. It can be the just a zip file, RPM package, whatever. You deploy this application somehow. Now, mm -hmm. in the kind of like a next to each application, we will have this uh, the data plane proxy, this sidecar okay. uh, uh, the component, and you can deploy them kind of like as a small, yeah, perfect, yeah, as a small, but and you 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 pick the perfect color for Envoy. That's it looks mm -hmm. like uh, the purple <laughs> is the official color of the logo of uh, Envoy. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, actually, yeah. I guess because uh, maybe I already knew a little bit, but it's Lyft, right? Lyft created it, so this is also uh, yeah, that's correct. The Lyft yes. pink, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, now our communication between those systems become. Uh huh. So you probably want to okay so. On VoIP proxy, on the card service, you want to put this on top of the service. And the product, okay. you want to do this on the bottom and the customers on the bottom. Because I want to show that the communication okay. between the services will be happening through um, through the data plane proxies. So that's why instead of like having the lines across the different, uh, different places, I want to have a lines uh, will not in, inter, intersect to each other. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you put so the nice yep, thing. perfect. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Perfect. Yes. And uh, and uh, now, uh, say whenever we need to call, say on the customer side of things. Imagine you have a, a route called slash customer slash all. For example, you can inside mm -hmm. the inside the box inside the box of the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, you can put you can use different uh, color of the market just to say you have a slash customer something and then yeah. slash cart slash cart slash items. Yeah, like I want to I want to demonstrate that this is a web service and it has a URL and it's a part of URL like slash cart slash something. Okay, got it. Uh... URL. It can be whatever. Yeah, it, it can be whatever. Yeah, but uh, part of the route. Victor.com slash cart. Yep. Cool. Listening? Yeah. Uh, the same thing the, the, on the products and, and, and uh, the same thing the, the yeah. I don't think you actually need to put the like a uh, um we we can oh okay i think i i got it i can instead of victor.com let's put uh -huh. this different one so inside uh let's talk about the, the uh, discovery inside a uh, service mesh a control plane provides the ways how we can um um discover the services so uh -huh. this application will have a distinct uh, url so we we call it products.mesh Okay. Every so, service, product mm -hmm. or cart dot mesh slash like items. So in every service, in this case, customers dot mesh uh, mm -hmm. will have. Um, uh, so dot mesh. This is the special type of uh, domain um, that uh, will be available across. Um, across service mesh so you will oh. always regardless where it is deployed and, and think about this the, okay. the this customer dot mesh can be deployed on vm your products dot uh -huh. mesh can be deployed in kubernetes and your cart dot mesh can be deployed on uh, bare metal but uh, for application connectivity uh, your application doesn't really care so you always the service always will be available through this url within the mesh okay uh, and that's the that's the mechanism of the service discovery that provided by um, by control plane of Kuma. Yeah. Discoverable URL. 
yeah and obviously uh, it's 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 a, it's a dns server it's a dns server that runs inside there um and um um you can customize this um uh, you can have a different url for a different uh, kind of like a zones uh, on the different regions and things like that so you will be able to have there's a kind of concept of uh, location awareness for example you want to have ability that your database deployed um you don't have to draw this right now i'm just like uh, giving the giving the, the the concept of this kind of uh how this all play together with the discoverability and the uh, multi multi zone deployment you might have um you might have deploy um your service <clears throat> uh that would be next to your database so you every time um you you call you only will be calling for the local data um and when the request comes in there will be gateway that will be routing this to the particular zone of the meshes and after that if this system will go down this gateway will be reconfigured and send the data to the backup site and things like that. But for application uh, purposes, you don't have to do anything. You will still have same kind of like a constant URL and things like that. Okay. Now, uh, say uh, we want to have uh, uh, add some some products information inside our cards. So the communication will be happening here. Uh, between uh, data plane proxies and whenever you will be calling a products.mesh uh, inside inside the service products mesh or no inside the um, inside the card.mesh items service that need to get the list of the products you will be calling uh, envoy you will be calling this uh, data plane proxy uh -huh. And uh, data plane proxy will be configured with the, the list of whatever is available. So it will know where to find this product. So this is how discovery will work. Um, also, the communication between those systems, between uh, between this like uh, purple, uh, purple components can be also encrypted. So you don't have to encrypt communication between your uh, data plane proxy and your application because it's a local host. Like if something is happened on this side of thing, you have a better, a bigger problems rather than uh, <laughs> someone is breached already. Uh, but communication between this Envoy proxies is also encrypted uh, using MTLS and it also provided with this. So I think you need to also draw some sort of like a distinct square that will be identify actual control plane that's running. Okay. Uh, you can pick up some some other color, maybe like blue or whatever you have. Uh, blue doesn't to... show up very well. I'll do a green yeah. box. So this is yeah, our Kuma blue. control plane. Yes, exactly. And uh, it can have a it can have like a small cylinder that will represent database. Essentially, it's the uh, okay. database where you store all the configuration in case of failure of this uh, the pod this configuration will be restored from the database it's persistent um in kubernetes I f yeah exactly so the configuration is persistent you can you can store this in external database or when in case of kubernetes it stores in its cd um or or whatever config db yeah now, uh, since we have a little bit of the uh, of the room down below, we can actually add another component here. So, I when I said um, when I said um, Akuma was designed to be in uh, distributed geography, uh, we need to talk about the concept of the global control plane. So, you can actually deploy one global control plane that would be um, maybe not necessarily needs to have any data planes to measure, but this global control plane will be sending this information to zone control planes. So you can put another um, uh, green square down below and the, put the, uh, I don't know, like a crown, <laughs> put the crown and call it the global control plane because- Is, it, all, would be it. is it also Kuma? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Let's see if I can. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure I could do it, but there it is. Yeah. You call and it, it also like, like uh, it's it's a Kuma and call it GCP. It's a global, global control plane. 
I'm I'm going to write out global control plane because GCP is very much Google Cloud Platform in my head. <laughs> Um, it does it, so it has its own config database. I'm making an assumption here. So uh, no, no, no. It can be. It, uh, it's just kind of like a de de uh, deployment um, uh, details, but it is yes. It is. It's uh, some sort of um, storage where the data is is is, is stored uh, because this is kind of like a brain of the brain. You know, kind of okay. like a, uh, y again, uh, you might have a, a your central neural system with your brain and you can have a peripheral neural system with your kind of spine brain so think about this like a global control plane is your brain brain and your uh you know spine brain <laughs> the, <laughs> the it's going to be a zone control plane you know so you okay. can and now the uh, you can have multiple things that you have uh, on the top so you can have mm -hmm. multiple zones that deploy it like this and your global control plane will be um responsible for for um, moving things around or or what we can do this you actually can, yeah right or yeah. you you can we can separate these apps mm -hmm. into zones and deploy each app in uh, each individual now it will complicate things because uh in this case we need to also draw here a zone ingress zone egress um we will just we will draw this like a small zone next to it yeah so Zone one, but yeah. then there are also and other let's, zones. And yeah, somewhere somewhere here, let's have a one small app. Let's call it uh, analytics, whatever. Uh, let's call it analytics, uh, and it will be available uh, analytics dot mesh uh, as a as a as a as a as application. That will be. Where's you, our? You, you wanna, where? you, yeah, you want to do zone two a little bit bigger. You want to do this a okay. little bit bigger, but uh, it should fit one application. One application with the yellow square. And okay. also, it should fit uh... another Kuma for its own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, it, it can be smaller. It's just for demonstrating yeah. that this. Um... Or reporting. It's easier to write. It's uh, much shorter than analytics. It's called reporting, whatever. Okay. And you can use um, light green to say reporting.mesh or report.mesh. Cool. So um, in order to manage Uh, in order to, uh, to to manage traffic between those systems, um, we have this, uh, um, between two zones, we have this component called the zone egress uh, and zone ingress that will allow these zones to communicate. So, for example, if your pro products um, applications wants to call a report application, they don't need to have a, you know, direct connection connection will go through this like small small you can you can draw another small um uh, envoy uh, square inside each zone uh when we need to send the traffic mm -hmm. out it would be egress when we need to send traffic in it would be ingress so two envoys or um it, it can be one uh, uh you know okay. and uh, uh draw them closer to the zone so you can uh, you can um, you can put the lines because they will be communicating through this like a zone ingress and ingress yeah exactly well this is fun <laughs> all right so and now communication between two zones, actual traffic, actual um, the the you know API calls from uh, from customers to reporting system will go through this um, proxy called uh, zone envoy zone uh, zone uh, zone ingress and zone egress. Now, you have a question. Oh, I have a I have a desire of what I want to do next, but you you seem to have a plan too. So let me state my desire, but I ultimately trust you. Like okay. what I want is now 
to tell a story about like a linear story about how all these things are going to interact with each other. And I think so much so that I want to write out like step one, step two and words. Mm -hmm. Even block my before we're doing that. I want, yeah, perfect. Yes, before we're doing this, I, I we need to put one last, um, one last component. Mm -hmm. Um, also would be purple, uh, but uh, we will call it, uh, we will call it uh, gateway. Uh, it can be on um, any zone, it can be on any zone, it can be on the its own zone, it's also fine. Just okay. put this it, in, the, in the bigger zone. In the bigger zone somewhere. Um, is it, in, in is other... it getting in and out of the zone? Yes. So outside, okay. it would be kind of like a thing that would be getting traffic into the system. Perfect. Yes. I would okay. not do this better. That's perfect. Okay. I wouldn't do it. It's, it's, it's perfect. Great. So, and in, in, think about this, what the gateway allows us to do, and this is where we can put this, like uh, victor.com slash customers, victor.com slash products, victor.com slash. Ah, uh, okay. So this yeah. is on the gateway side of things, we can put the victor in front. Okay. Wow. Uh, and now we can, we can talk about linear, um, we can talk about linear uh, uh, representation of this uh, use case. So Great. when the request comes in, when the request comes in, uh, we usually have API gateway in front of this. Um, and um, API gateway is essentially a, you know, if you, again, I love all of metaphors and I like to talk about mm -hmm. metaphors. It's a bouncer. You're going into the club. You're going into mm -hmm. the club uh, and in order to check your credentials, you have a, a, a appropriate drinking age, you have a appropriate, um, um, I don't know, attire, dress code, and things like that. In our case, it was going to check the permissions, notification, authorization. You have a correct JOT token, uh, but also your request is properly formed. You can do some validation on the gateway side of thing. You want to get the list of the products first. So when the traffic comes in, goes into gateway. Now, so this gateway is also part of the service mesh. Um, Kuma has this concept of uh, a built-in gateway. That's essentially another instance of uh, Envoy. Uh, and ah. for configuration of this gateway, uh, Kuma implements Gateway API, which is uh, hopefully I'm really looking forward for some of the announcements that it will be going out of the um, uh, out of the beta. Uh, uh -huh. You configure those routes using Gateway API. And mm -hmm. the since it's running in the service mesh, it has a context of how to discover these uh, products. So Gateway knows every time you hit uh, victor.com slash products, uh, inside Gateway will translate this because it's going to be products.mesh slash products. Mm -hmm. And Gateway will, will make the request to data plane proxy that will front our product mesh slash products. Um, cool. So it's a product request coming in. Yeah. Gateway makes requests to uh, products microservice to the yeah. the the proxy of products microservice. Yes. Okay. And uh, send the response back. Along the way, along the way, Gateway can inject, uh, say, tracing headers so we would know uh, what is happening with this request. Mm hmm. And uh, those. Uh, those things will be uh, available uh, on uh, control plane will be collecting this and send this data into Jaeger to visualize and draw a dashboard. So the Kuma, this Kuma instance is, is collecting the information. Yeah. So every, so, okay. So technically um, it is each node will be reporting to um to Jaeger but when we configure this 
on the on the Kumo side, we're just defining the policy. We're saying that from the service A for the service uh, gateway to the service product, we need to mm-hmm. collect the traces. So that's where we can declare this declarative uh, tracing policies. Um, so at some point we might have uh, our um, security and compliance people saying, okay, so we see that right now everyone can communicate to everyone inside this mesh. We need to have explicit communication that only uh, uh, card service can invoke products directly and only gateway can invoke product directly. So for example, customers cannot invoke mm. pro- products directly. And you will mm-hmm. be able to create this uh, declarative policy mm-hmm. and uh, whenever it is not uh, whatever it is not the case, we will just like throw uh, throw error. Another thing that we can do since we're already controlling the flow of the traffic we mm-hmm. realize that uh, we might have uh, this uh, reporting uh, the service uh, might rely on some sort of third party or say products or or card service might rely on um, currency exchange. And currency uh. exchange may be a very expensive service. We need to limit how many times we can invoke it. So we okay. can we can we can configure a rate limiting policy. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, limit how much uh, we want to call uh, the services. So whenever applications in is de- are deployed in this environment, we can do a lot of things uh, with the flexibility and the dynamically reconfiguring different rules without changing application code or without even redeploying application. Mm-hmm. Um, and thanks to this environment, uh, we do have, uh, um, we can deploy another zone and say offload this, we, we feel that, you know, the cart application needs to be deployed on. We have a customers on the West Coast, we have a customers on the East Coast. Let's deploy these card services on the West Coast. Let's deploy card services on the East Coast. And we mm-hmm. will have a global load balancer that will be running our request, we know that the request comes in from San Francisco. We can mm-hmm. send this into the card service that will be deployed inside the zone that would be closer to our users. Is that hope happening here in the global control plane of Kuma? So global or- control plane has all topology of what is happening in the system. And it is uh, every every time one of our operator will would want to communicate with our um different uh, different zones different meshes it will go into global control plane global control plane for consistency will have a f- full snapshot of global configuration and uh-huh. it would know how to send the configuration to zone um, uh, zone control planes we have a question uh, yes um is zone envoy a gateway to communicate to each other so we have these zone envoys that we yeah, exactly. That's different so the, from the gateway, or yes. is it the same thing? It, it is. It is different. So gateway. No, I mean, like uh, technically, it's a, it's a they they both gateways, but from perspective of vocabulary of the, um, of the system, uh, zone ingress not 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 necessarily needs to be you know uh, available uh, for users to consume. So it is. It can be only conduit to communicate between the zones. So short answer is yes. Zone uh, 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 zone ingress. This is what we use to communicate between the zones within the service mesh. Cool. Um, I think that that's that's pretty much it. Um, from perspective of like all this all these things, and um, with this picture, we can also go back to our mm-hmm. previous statements, the things that we already discussed, and uh, put them into the perspective um, and oh, uh, you know, explain all the things using this diagram. Okay. So whatever you know, whatever you want, you can pick some of the things and uh, using this diagram, we will be able to explain everything um, that we just, you know, we spent our <laughs> talking. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, do you want to go down this serv- what service mesh list? Do you think? 
Yeah. Or we could yeah. talk about these three Kuma benefits in terms of this diagram. Yeah, we can talk five? about what the first first one. Like, uh, let's talk about this. So, the service mesh gives you uh, service discoverability, regardless yeah. where your application is deployed. You you mm -hmm. will be able to do this through um, built-in DNS system dot mesh. That's how you. Um, okay. Uh, that's how you will be able to do service discovery. Okay. So connection between the application and different retries so this thing is also handled on the proxy side of things and uh, whenever we feel that we will not be able to reach it communication between different data planes uh programmatically will you know increase the timeouts increase the retries and things like that so so these it's all about these three proxies talking to each other when in terms right. of these three microservices there's no um no yeah. other way around it okay so like and, if this uh, is a more complicated um interaction like if if this if the call went to products but the products needs to see what's in the cart to know the inventory before it can give a response it, instead of it going just here and back it would go from here to here and then back yeah exactly okay cool yeah um, we have a centralized control over configuration so we know mm -hmm. um the control plane provides ui um i i don't know why i didn't mention this at the very beginning it but people love uh, nice uis um uh -huh. so every control plane you will be able to have a like a the vi visual representation what kind of services running what kind of policies enabled what kind of data plane proxies are affected by certain policies that's also very useful um to to know when you try to debug something oh my policy is not applied like let's see if you actually apply the policy for correct uh, data plane proxy mm -hmm. um, so yes so uh i want to um i'm not quite ready to move on i want i'm still just wrapping around my head <laughs> around one request so we talked about if yes. it was more complex what that would look like yes. and then it also like then the sends the response back uh, and receives response and yeah. then and then you you kind of answered this before but i want to capture it so as a as a human i can observe this that happened through my Q kuma my uh zone one kuma instance ui is that true um as a human you want to observe this on the global control plane side of things because you will have a okay. view on uh, all the zones that deploy Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, as a as an operator or SRE, you will be able to to use a global control plane. And then um and then this will probably maybe this will take us there, but you also talked yeah. about like, oh, if I want to um if I want to put a, a de another instance of a cart app in a different zone or move this particular cart app to a different zone, that's an easy thing to do. Uh, yes. So whenever you have uh, your deployment, uh, um, your deployment tools will stay the same. Um, so, for example, like not to say the same you you in order to 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 deploy this application on different zone you need to make sure that you know have them appropriate kubernetes cluster you have a right uh, um enough enough resources to do this once you deploy this and they will be deployed across and the service mesh is already configured the the card dot mesh service will just appear and the traffic will go um just like immediately Does moreover it... okay yeah Go ahead. Go ahead. If it's a brand new microservice versus migrating one, the system doesn't know about, or uh, that the system already knows about, is that the same type of work, or is it different? Uh, if we if we're assuming that we're running this Kubernetes, you just deploy this in the namespace that has uh, enabled uh, sidecar injection, and uh, the microservice will register in uh, in the in the in the zone okay. zone control plane, and you will be able to see this. It's it's not. Uh, it's not heavy lifting. It's just like a another just another day in the office. Just you know, deploy another microservice. And 
Adding zones and adding applications are each a relatively simple operation. Is that yeah. with Kubernetes? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, basically, everything will end up uh, writing a bunch of YAMLs. <laughs> <laughs> That's In, um... uh, it, Either either it's going to be kind of like a, the 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 mesh config, configuration, which is YAML file. It can be form on CRD, um, or um, uh, or it's going to be some sort of like a label on existing uh, a resource, like a namespace or or service or whatever. Does every zone have a gateway? Uh, if they need to communicate to each other, uh, if the traffic from one zone needs to go to another, it will require to have a zone ingress. Um, if the traffic needs to come in, someone needs to invoke this. If, say, my reporting system, my reporting application needs to call products for some reasons, it will require zone egress so the traffic can go out. So. Uh, and for application and for applications uh -huh. like reporting applications those things are uh transparent they don't need to know that they go the egress and ingress they are technical components that needs to be there in order to have a you know two-way communication between the systems but for call for report application to call say product application um they don't need to know about this you know multiple hops that will happen so my understanding is that gateway is needed for public traffic, like external yeah. to the system. Yeah. And if you're communicating within the system, that's when these zone envoys communicate directly with each other. Correct. So, uh, so external traffic is needed for the gateway. And then mm -hmm. this can be internal traffic. Yes. Precisely, yes. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, that's great. I, that helps me understand a lot what's happening. Um, okay. So we have centralized. So we talked about connections between apps and retries. So I guess I can capture that here. So, um, So all apps communicate with each other through these proxies. Correct. Uh, and then this has a couple of benefits. Is this still on the board? Good. Yeah. So one is the one is the retries. But the other is probably security and MTLS is my guess. Is that correct? Precisely. And also observability. Oh, nice. Retries, rate limiting, circuit breakers, um, all those things can be configured um, declaratively. So if you need to put some like a... So you know that one of the service would be more flaky than another service. You need to have a uh, you know more time uh, for 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 uh, for service to respond. Uh, you will be able to tune this individually um, in front of the service. Great. Um. Good. And so next one is exposing the app to external traffic, which we talked about with with the gateway. And we kind of talked about too um, how it's a new thing for me, at least, that the service mesh is also taking care of the gateway. To me, I learned that that the ingress yeah. or the is a totally separate project. Yeah. So, um, can you maybe talk about that and why we're wrapping it into one project here? <laughs> why? Yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. So, um, in uh, um, in the majority of situ actually it's, it was it was there even with like Istio system also for a while it has this like a uh built-in uh, 
I, I forgot the name. I, I forgot the, what the, the name they were using. Um, but essentially, ability to expose the service to outside world uh, mm -hmm. was one of the things that uh, service meshes were, were able to do for a very long time. However, mm -hmm. usually when we're talking infrastructure people, infrastructure people, um, they tend to use whatever the tooling was there before, even before Kubernetes, maybe even before all these things. And uh, uh, people would use uh, things like... Um, the, the Kong, APG, Nginx, just uh, or even Apache for that matter, as a kind of like a the way to put the load balancer in front of their their application. Um, so in Akuma, we have a support for two things of uh, two gateways uh, the, or two types of gateways. One is built in. There are situations where you don't really care about all this API management stuff. You just want to put the load balancer in front of your, your applications and flow traffic uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to your system. Uh, technically, the way how it works in the Kubernetes, we know that there's a type of service called load balancer that um, mm -hmm. allows you to get external IP address. So this external IP address will be acquired. You will be able to uh, give this uh, uh, DNS name for the service and the people will be able to access to your application. Uh, there's nothing fancy here. So you can mm -hmm. also scale this. You can run multiple instances so you can have a, like a real a load balancing functionality. Uh, but since it is built-in gateway part of Mesh, you will have all the benefits of the mesh automatically collecting metrics automatically enable mtls since you, it's joined there it's part of mtls it's already secured inside inside the uh, inside the gateway uh inside the inside the service mesh. another uh type of uh gateway it's called delegated mm -hmm. sometimes you before you join the service mesh sometimes you already have a solution to to um to get your application traffic. outside world yeah mm -hmm. you have a you have a traffic you have a uh um uh what what's the what's the thing that you were talking about uh see uh co 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 contour a contour yes so you have a contour you have an ambassador you have a uh obviously kong uh, uh -huh. you have a like just nginx uh, ingress control just simple ingress or some more fancy thing and uh kuma allows to integrate with this so-called like a delegated uh so meaning that kuma will not deploy data plane proxy next uh -huh. to this uh, uh, delegated uh, proxy but also will be able to uh the pass the traffic from gateway into uh into service mesh okay. so many people don't sense. really care about the more complex solutions so that's why we come up with this okay so just let, give them gateway just give them gateway yeah uh, uh that allows them to stay consistent in their configuration um mm -hmm. and they will be able to send the, out, the outside traffic um, um, to their applications. Um, so I would, is that, so basically if you are uh, building a system from the ground up or you don't already have an Ingress implementation, in general service, Kuma specifically, and maybe in general, Kuma service mesh has evolved so much that it's able to do those things. Like yeah. if if a, like a contour and emissary ingress both use Envoy proxy sidecars, and so is Kuma using Envoy proxy sidecars. So why not could have one technology be able to do the configuration for all the types of things? Correct. But um, but the difference is that Kuma is going to have a very simple implementation because it's probably it's this younger in terms of being yeah. in terms of doing it, um, where something like contour or emissary where that's their full gig is going to yeah. have more be more fully featured so and remember like hour ago i asked the, the there was some question about um auth uh, and how you can would you know provide the these integrations so mm -hmm. usually it's a good practice to auth it's the way how you authenticate and like a work with the external users of your system so you usually put this on the gateway side of things you know uh mm -hmm. so whenever a user comes in 
this is where you need to check if they have the right credentials, they have the right um, access things. You check in this on the gateway side of things. Um, you can pass through some of the information, you know, some some special header that will include what if the user certificated or not. But usually, it is a, the gateway is dealing with this. If I will bring back to my uh, metaphors, gateway is the bouncer, but uh, uh -huh. service mesh service mesh in this case it would be server that would be you know routing you to the party where you will be going and <laughs> meeting with other people so you came into bar everyone checks your this and after that you will have a hostess or, or server will lead you to the party if you want uh -huh. to say hey i want to talk um i want to talk to, to john doe and uh, uh -huh. this person will will take you there so you will have it will be responsible for you know the your your mingling it's like a host in your in your party uh, uh -huh. whenever you don't know where to where i find john you talk into uh -huh. the host and uh, this is your okay. doing the service okay. discovery um uh -huh. and nice. uh whenever you kind of like uh uh it feels <laughs> like someone is you know the pouring you too much uh, alcohol and the host uh -huh. can intervene saying hey no that i think that's enough and this is where we have a traffic control and the rate limiting and all these kind of things um and uh also host can uh, look after you and uh, like uh, watching how many uh the glasses of drink you 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 already finished that's your observability bit um you're collecting the <laughs> metric of the of the things also host will be responsible seeing like how many people you interact with that's the tracing uh, bit uh, that also play, plays out so. that's fun Okay, we have, I want to get through this list, but also we have a, a question from Kormaju. Um, How does a pod, let's see. How does a pod placed in Kubernetes, Kubernetes using Kubernetes control plane or Kuma control plane? So can you explain how a pod placed in Kuma service mesh environment? So uh, when a pod is created, this is, let me answer and then you can tell me if I'm right. So um, when a pod is created, which is something done like on the worker node by the directed by the kubelet, that's when it's going to inject a sidecar, a Kuma pod to that. Well, technically an Envoy proxy pod that is running alongside the application. So and it knows to do that because that's configured on the Kubernetes control plane to happen. But, um, and that's something you do as part of installing Kuma and then setting up uh, part of the admission controller process in terms of, is that, I'm kind of flubbing it up, but. Um, no, no, uh, yeah. it is, uh, uh, you, you get the juice right. So you as a developer, when you run your application inside Kubernetes, you can subscribe to different type of events that happened. So Kubernetes provides you the way how you can do this. And one of the things that uh, uh, allows you to do is to set and getting events on the namespace. How you would do this? You just get the list of namespaces, validate list of um, uh, labels on this namespace. If this list uh, of uh, this label has uh, Kuma IO slash something, I forgot the name, um, a sidecar injection. So <clears throat> Kuma sits and listen all, all events that happen in this uh, namespace. Whenever there would be event that will be creating a uh, pod, Kuma, uh, being as a kind of like a controller that runs inside the Kubernetes cluster, will intersect this, this process. And during the process of creation, it also will inject some additional metadata. Uh, this step is also absolutely um, optional because when you're creating your deployment in your container spec, you actually can put multiple containers. You can put this manually and explicitly for every container. But usually people don't do this because it will require uh, extra lines of YAML. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, whenever you're running this with control plane and data plane and it takes care of automation, it definitely helps when you need to do upgrade. So you're upgrading mm -hmm. control plane, control plane checking that you have uh, all data planes. Mm -hmm. you, can, uh, you can bounce the pod. When you redeploy mm -hmm. the pod, it will update uh, sidecar. Yeah. Or All even if things... you want to change some configuration, like, oh, you know what? I want to set our rate limiting differently. 
I'm going, I, I just change it one place in the Kuma control plane and then it's going to automatically inject my changes into the stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, but those are uh, kind of like a, if you want to change the rules for um, for rate limiting, it is kind of like a next step. It's your your pod okay. already managed by um, uh, by control plane. Uh, I think okay. what is uh, um, okay. uh, Kamaraju is asking is, uh, is is the deployment step, like who is responsible for um, uh, deploying the pods. So you're deploying mm -hmm. the pods as usual. It's a business as mm -hmm. usual in Kubernetes. Uh, you deploy your pod, you have a deployment, you have your service, so you have whatever you, you have when you need to deploy this. And uh, only thing that you need to keep in mind if you enable automatic sidecar injection or you do this, you know, manually. So again, manually, what you can do, you can do deployment patch, you know, you can, you know, you deploy deployment. After that, you can provide the, the patch and put the, the site. There's multiple ways how you can do this, but this is a, this is a, not, not a, none beyond the, the, the discussion. It's something like it's irrelevant. And how, it, how you deploy a, your applications, it's, uh -huh. it's up to you. And, and as a, as a developer who's consuming it, it's something that you don't need to concern yourself with. It just uh, automatically pretty, happens. Pretty, pr pretty much, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it feels like magic, but uh, essentially it's just uh, it's just a, a lot of uh, automating, uh, lots of steps are just automated for you. Um, if you don't want to do this, everything can be done manually, and it's just like uh, just any 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 deployment that you can do with Kubernetes. Any SRE uh, of you know who um, have a I don't know, like experience deploying any apps uh, will will tell you, you know, whatever you need to do as a developer. So um, also it also it can be put through the pipeline with the Argo, uh, with the, you know, the CICD pipelines, um, with Argo, with Flux or whatever you have, like uh, whatever tools, Helm, whatever. Um, cool. Um, so next up we have connection pooling. On our, how does connection pooling happen in our diagram? Yeah. So the things with the, um, uh, maybe it is not uh, like 100% connection pooling that we did in, in the past, but uh, essentially um, the communication between the system will be will still handled everything that you need to do with this. You can do uh, some of the, you know, the caching, uh, different retries. You know, one of the big, big thing that was uh, where we're doing on the connection pools uh, during the database times is just, you know, having retries or automatically, you know, reconnecting things. It's already handled. Uh, we already talked about this in. Um, cool. By the, the state. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah the exactly. Pro, 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 talking with pro, each exactly. other. Yes. Uh -huh. Cool. And then secure observability, I guess we talked about too. So it's all of that's happening in this yeah, layer. Yeah. Cool. And then in terms of relating other things we talked to about to this diagram, I think maybe talking about what things are and where they sit. So this could, this can be, these apps can be different pods in the Kubernetes cluster, or they could be different VMs, or they can be whole different physical machines. It, regardless, it all works the same. Is that correct? Yes, it does. It, uh, it, it, seems, it, is, it is correct, yes. With this conversation, I'm gathering it's a bit more difficult to install if it's a VM or a physical machine than it is if it's Kubernetes. There's some things that can be automated if it's Kubernetes that can't be automated if it's another type of system. Is that correct? Correct. So I did, um, I did a stream. Um, I did a stream with my colleague. Um, uh, Mike Beaumont, he's one of the engineers on the on the Kuma, and he's one of the uh, people who's actively involved in the Gateway API. And we actually showed how we started um, uh, two zones. One zone was just on VMs. So we we just used like um, um, uh, EC2 instance and uh, Kubernetes instance, and we showed that some of the stuff that we, we can do for you out of the box in Kubernetes that needs to be manually done. Um, so we need to uh, we need to register one of the one of the zones in inside our Kuma. We get a token. This token will be signed every request that the control plane and data plane will be doing. 
uh, after that, um, kind of like we establish this connection, we join this application into this uh, in, into this mesh, and after that, we show how to use in gateway. We gradually um, uh, we deployed second version of this application, but this time we deployed this inside Kubernetes, and using uh -huh. gateway functionality, we gradually oh. change the um, uh, request rate that goes into VMs, and uh, over the time. Cool. We reduce number of requests that goes into VM by zero, and all requests will go into um, uh, into Kubernetes, uh, like 100%. So this is uh, not only for application deployment, but also for application migration for I don't know, the, the people that, uh, that might cringe about this, like cloud modernization uh, <laughs> or you know the cloud <laughs> migration. That's one yeah, of the yeah. one of the things no, you real. once you. Once yeah. You, yeah, exactly. You started this um, in your data centers. You want to go in the cloud. You want to go with the managed the managed services. You can gradually migrate your workloads, and with the tools that already described here, yeah. like on the gateway side of things, you can you can assign different weights to different version of the application. Mm -hmm. So when the user will comes in, uh, user will will send to application. And they don't know which version they're running. Mm -hmm. if it's a, and you can gradually use this approach uh, to do cloud migration. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to write cloud modernization a system. I can help with what? With um, if uh, mod modernizing an app to cloud, mother exactly uh, application modernization um, uh, migration to the cloud or huh. cross cloud. I think we were talking about VMs. We were talking about uh, uh, um, uh, bare metal, but mm -hmm. more of often we have a use case where we have a multi-cloud deployment some people have a, want mm -hmm. to have a um, amazon cluster and google cloud cluster and azure cluster so with service mesh you will be able to have unified uh, communication regardless of your uh, cloud of choosing cool so because Kuba is universal, it can help with application modernization and migration to cloud or multi-cloud. And so uh, one thing I wrote while you were talking, but I'll also say verbally, is when we say it can run on Kubernetes or VMs or bare metal, it can also be run in any combination of those things, which is pretty powerful. And That's even cool. Windows. And even Windows. <laughs> would you have a would you have a use case? It would, uh, uh, would you have a versions of the? It's it's kind of like a more on the enterprise version side of things. So we have a Kong mesh that we built on top of Kuma, and uh, we do have a uh, one or two customers who wants to run their workloads on Windows, and they need to have a data plane proxies deployed to next to their web applications uh, or like uh, the Windows applications. Um. Cool. Yeah. And then the other thing I want to mention here um, is geographically. So are zones always going to be in different geographical reason, regions? Like, is that the point of zones? Um, not necessarily. Uh, okay. But that's the biggest, uh, biggest use case. How do people use? Um, uh, I, I, I did the, um, and not the last year. So like, uh, maybe. Two two years ago on the Kong Summit, I also did the demo multi um, multi zone deployment of the um, of the Kuma, where I, I showed the example how uh, location aware load balancing can be taken into consideration. It's a it's a big uh, yeah. big use case for organizations who wants to run uh, geo like they have a specific geo geographical mm -hmm. requirements to do this. So mm -hmm. that's why we usually um, kind of have a common term. Okay, so we're doing this like a, a geographically distributed, but um, whatever they want to use to segregate or like change where the things will be deployed and things like that. Cool. So I think I think that's all we need to do to relate everything that we talked about to our diagram. Is there anything else you feel like we should mention 
as far as that goes. Um, so one of the one of the things uh, in in terms of developer experience, uh, we right now uh, in the process of rewriting some of the the rules uh, for better simplicity. We're always looking to ways how we can improve and simplify um, uh, user experience. So uh, so right now, if, if, if someone will go to Kuma documentation right now, kuma.io, and you will find there would, would be some something like a, say, policy called rate limiting policy and called mesh rate limit policy. So the mesh prefix, that would be new policies. And we recommend everyone, if you're starting over, just use them, even though they say they in beta, but we recommend people to start this. Um, if you go in from the uh, previous versions of the Kuma and you're trying to... Um, uh, go to 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 new versions, uh, stick to the old versions, or like uh, over the time try to migrate. Um, you cannot have both um, uh, versions because they might conflict, and the rule engine might go crazy about uh, what kind of like services needs to be matched there. Uh, but we we believe that uh, starting with the Kuma 2.0, we believe that this um, uh, those policies that we introduced and they would be better uh, for much much more clear and cleaner it, it, the definition how those rules would be applied cool. um and uh there's some like some advanced features uh that potentially can be implemented things uh say wasm like a web assembly mm -hmm. is the big thing in envoy yeah. has engine that allows you to execute uh the web assembly uh filters um in order to configure this there's no policy but mm -hmm. kuma provides the generic way we call it a uh, proxy template that with the proxy template we can inject actual snippets of envoy uh envoy configuration that's kind of like a more advanced use case remember when i was talking okay. about this uh brain uh brain to 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 arm connection uh -huh. uh, brain will interpret it kind of like a human uh, readable uh, or human understandable words and after uh -huh. that will translate to the signals that will understand this so Kuma yeah. does this by providing you syntax of the policies because everything uh -huh. will be translated down to uh envoy configurations yeah with the and... proxy template you have ability mm -hmm. kind of like a like like a neural link you can just inject uh, yourself and start programming your hand directly without brain same thing with the proxy template. You will have ability to program directly into uh, maybe have some advanced filtering configured. You want to have a uh, some envoy filters, uh, the WebAssembly filters enabled on the every data plane proxy. Um, how you can do this? This is how we can do this. You need to provide the uh, the proxy template. Um, we didn't talk much. Again, it's a more advanced routing. It's called uh, we have virtual outbound. It's kind of ability to have some sort of like a NAT-like system inside the service mesh. Um, uh, I did the example. I did the, the uh, I guess, uh, last year at the service mesh con, I showed how we can use the virtual outbound inside, um, uh, inside the service mesh in order to represent uh, or like hide some of the Kafka details. For example, mm -hmm. Kafka, again, see, full circle, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm i bringing everything uh, the, the, together. Um, essentially, Kafka, uh, in order to client, uh, application client connect to Kafka, each, um, each node of the Kafka cluster needs to be available because Kafka uh, doesn't do any kind of like a low server side load balancing. It's it's called like a client side load balancing using consistent hashing. So every mm -hmm. um, every node needs to be exposed. But this is also difficult in the world of uh, you know ever changing the the nodes addresses and things like mm -hmm. that. By yeah. providing like a virtual outbound, we can have a consistent naming that will be backed by um, Jesus, uh, uh, what was the, um, uh, there is a demo says, what was the another one? Uh, Replic set, no. Uh, stateful set? Stateful set, exactly. Yes, thank you uh -huh. so much. Yeah. Uh, backed by stateful set, we will be using stateful set to deploy nodes. And after that, we'll use virtual outbound to have a very nice looking URLs. For example, Kafka 1, Kafka 2, Kafka 3. Oh, mesh, nice. These type cool. of things. So cool, cool, cool. There, is a, there are a lot of like uh, some of the advanced uh, things on the routing uh, that we will try to support. 
but I think this is the uh, <laughs> this is the this is a question for a different um, uh, for the third different stream. Maybe maybe uh, you know write down yeah. like if this video will get uh, I don't know five thousand views and we have a thousand likes. Uh, I will come back and we'll talk about Kafka on Kubernetes and the Kafka on Service Mesh. How about that? Yeah. Is it is it like a Kuma two hundred one or is it? Yeah. 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 It's yeah. more like a yeah. It's more like a three hundred one because uh, right. yeah, three hundred one. It's will be more. Advanced. Cool. So to wrap up, if anyone has any questions, please do ask them now. To wrap up, what I'm going to do is take a few minutes and, and go recap everything we talked about to make sure I have a good understanding and therefore everyone who's watching also has a good understanding. And um, we can go from zero to 100 on Kuma in, in two hours. We got this. And then, um, and then to close it out, I'm going to replay the intro music and we're going to dance a little bit and then say goodbye. So that's what's happening. All okay. right. So we started the, the, the by saying... Um, what's the service mesh? It's a technology that gives you a centralized control plane over application communication, which is, a, I love that definition because a lot of, uh, before I started the series on service mesh, I 100% had the idea that service mesh has to be a, a, a Kubernetes sidecar and it does not. So, um, so the goal is not to have to hard code some, this, some of this stuff into the application stuff like. Uh, service discoverability, connections between apps, including retries, centralized configuration, um, exposing the app to external traffic, connection pooling, security observability. These are all things that can be done in a service mesh, and then our application developer doesn't need to worry about hard coding it into their application at all, which is apparently how it used to be done. Um, it's someone we have a, a couple of thank yous. Kumarju says thank you. Thanks for answering all my questions with analogies. <laughs> and then we also have a nice thank from Epic Tralala, they said, who said it's time to test Kuma, which is great. Yes, let's play. Yes, That's the next step. Let's go. Um, so then we needed we needed to give some context to this whole scene. So we talked about things like Envoy. Envoy is a super fast proxy. And it's used in many technologies. So I just wrote the ones we've, we've touched on, on uh, in Lightning. So it's used, besides in Kuma, it's used in Istio, Contour, Emissary Ingress, et cetera. But what I understand about Envoy is that it's very, very, very complex. And it's not really meant to be interfaced with, with hum by humans directly. You need a another technology to make it, uh, like just like you can't understand how your brain is making your hands move like that's too far advanced it is, but we uh, just know it uh, happens. they even they even have their own uh the protocol it's called uh, i think xds it's the protocol that they use it's gRPC based but this uh -huh. protocol used to communicate between uh, between proxies between the the control plane and proxy so it is whole another level of, of uh, you know, of and I'm not trying to pretend that I know everything about this because uh, uh -huh. the protocol is very complex, configuration is very complex, uh, but also very flexible. Cool. So um, so Linkerd is different from Kuma in that it doesn't use Envoy. It uses its own, um, uh, it uses its own, I said Envoy, but I meant prox. Oh, it doesn't use Envoy. It uses its own proxy that it wrote. And and to just do the bare minimum that service mesh needs to do, and and trying to make it lighter weight, and then Istio uses Envoy, but it is has a hard dependency on Kubernetes. So Kuma is a universal control plane for your service mesh that uses Envoy, but it is not Kubernetes specific. It can run Kubernetes VMs or bare metal. And then just for more context, um, a control plane is the brain that you, you set the config in the control plane and then the control plane in turn configures the data plane and the data plane is responsible for actually doing the thing. So Kuma has, when it was created, these technologies already existed, but it had three, three goals to make a, a new service mesh that, that is needed in the, in the space. One is we want a super duper simple developer experience. Second is that word universal, the universal mesh where it can be run on Kubernetes, but it could also be run on VMs or on physical machines or on any combination thereof, which is um, important that we'll get to later. And, and the third thing is we want that for it to be able to be geographically distributed 
And we want that to come out of the box. We want it to be easy to do geographical dis uh, distributed systems. So some of the benefits of Kuma, we have universal discoverability. Um, and that way I would say was is part of a simple developer experience. So it's it's easy to to find the different services that are running in your system. We have declarative traffic policies. So one example we gave of that is like if um, only a gateway service is allowed to call the products uh, uh service directly. only the gateway is, is is allowed to directly call products or any such thing only yeah um so you can make your traffic policies declarative uh there's security so we're automating the act of of secure connection so um uh, without any thought there's going to be mtls communicating between our systems and then we also talked about um for the certificate rotation is is automated too and then we have observability as one of our benefits so metrics traces logs we have apparently there's a very nice ui that we would so in this system we'd, we'd check out the ui of our global control plane to see everything that's going on and yeah. then um there a lot of things are automated for us and come out by of the, the way box. if you want to see all this ui just go check out our stream that we did with whitney uh, at the cncf uh, youtube oh. channel yeah, yeah you'll, you'll see UI and uh, like one one last thing in um, in uh, on the global side of things. We actually you know b before before I was um, before I was on the stream, uh, we didn't have this, but we just announced that we we have now managed global control plane um, as a as a as a part of our kind of like a Kong uh, Kong Connect platform. So we use this technology. Um, internally and we also provide a kind of like a experience if you don't want to or like there is no need for you to to host a global control plane we can host it for you and you can plug a different uh, the different cloud providers with this uh, global control plane cool. so you will be able to to have a one one view to all your uh, deployments. Actually, I think I, it's it, it, it will make a great demo. I need to do this. I need to do this for, <laughs> for QCon. Cool, cool. Yeah, totally. So um, so these benefits, pretty much all of them can be um, realized without the developer having to change their application code. The only thing is traces is the only exception. So um, in addition to all this rad um, service mesh stuff, Kuma can also be a simple ingress too. So if you don't already have an ingress implementation, it can be, it can help you do that. But if you already do have an ingress implementation, it can plug into your ingress into your current ingress pretty easily. So you can run Kuma either as a sidecar in Kubernetes, so in in the same pod as your running application, and or you can run it as an operating system process, which is a more involved installation. So if you do it as a sidecar, um, it's it's good because it's easier and it's good because Envoy shares the network with the application container, which helps with all the automation and just simplicity in terms of setting it up. So then we um, we took some time. At, like, it's like a win, lose, or draw, or like a Pictionary situation where you describe to me what to draw and I'm drawing a system. But I like that because but I really you like did a great them. job and uh, you thank you you um, you even left a little bit um, on the screen so you will be able to you know we will be able to see you yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a problem I need to solve every time so <laughs> yes. uh, so but I like I like the act of talking through it because we're we're talking about why we're choosing to what to put where I think that's valuable um, discussion so so in this system, a product request would come in through the gateway, and then the gateway itself is part of the Kubernetes, the Kuma service mesh. And then the gateway would make, make the request for products, for example, and then, and then it would receive the response. And so the gateway can inject tracing headers there. And also you can, this would be a good place if you wanted to set that policy that we talked about, the declarative traffic policy, you could do that here. And then as a human, everything that's moving around the system, I can observe all of that in the global control plane in a nice, a nice UI. And then if you're using Kubernetes, part of what makes the Kubernetes implementation nice is that you can add different zones or you can add different applications. And it's a pretty simple process. Like it's the, the stuff's already injected and everything is discoverable. 
And then also, like leave like related to Kubernetes, because these can be VMs, they can be physical machines. If you're an organization that's looking to uh, modernize, that's looking to upgrade your stuff from VMs to Kubernetes, you can implement Kuma on both. And then you can even use Kuma to like slowly move your traffic from one system to another. So um, it seems like it could be a really helpful part in terms of your modernization journey as the <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah and i think that's that's it the geo what do yeah i think Where you did, did a great down? job uh, explaining everything and summarizing everything it was a lot <laughs> yeah we got okay yeah great thank you i'm happy you're happy this is is there anything you would like to add to the board i can i'll find a way to fit it on uh, no, I Do think uh, the, uh, put this uh, kuma.io, this is the place where you can start with this. Uh, yeah, you can I'll learn uh, where you can uh, deploy this, how you can deploy. If you think there's something uh, that can be improved, uh, it is uh, open source. Uh, we have a Slack um, where you can um, seek for help um, and uh, find a bunch of you know training resources. Just Google uh, Kuma Service Mesh on the YouTube. You probably find some of the videos me or my colleagues were doing about right this. In. Awesome. Cool. Let's dance our goodbyes. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, Victor, for sharing your time and attention with us. I appreciate you. Oh, yeah. Here we go. We're going to dance until the bass comes in. That's all. Yeah. I like it. I'll do yours. <laughs> I have a you can't see my body, so I do a lot with my hands to try to <laughs> convey that I'm dancing. Here we go. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. I appreciate it.